So I want to cover the subject of free expression. Uh, this is something I've obviously covered recently and uh, I'll probably be going over areas that I've been through before, but I think this is very, very important. So if I do repeat myself, it's, it's okay because the issues are always topical. Um, before I get onto that main subject, I just want to briefly cover something that's in the news, which of course is the German federal election. Angela Merkel has uh, defeated Martin Schulz and won her fourth term as Chancellor of Germany, which makes her the fifth longest serving German Chancellor in history. Um, after, let me get this right, after Otto von Bismarck, Helmut Kohl, Konrad Adenauer and Adolf Hitler, she becomes the fifth longest serving German Chancellor. She's also the longest serving non-royal uh, woman leader in European history, uh, just surpassing Margaret Thatcher. Merkel has now been in power for 11 years, 284 days. Margaret Thatcher was 11 years and 209 days, so she's just defeated or just surpassed Margaret Thatcher. So um, it looks like the CDU, CSU coalition is going to have to look at its options, either getting into a grand coalition with the SPD, as I understand it, or getting into a coalition, a so-called Jamaica coalition, with the Free Democrats and the Greens um, and the AFD um, Nationalist Party has done better than expected, which really indicates something about the way things are in Europe at the moment. But anyway, um, I don't want to make this whole video about that. I only mentioned it because I'm not sure if I'll be making a, an individual video on it. When it comes to free expression, um, if you ask someone what are the hallmarks of a democracy, what are the hallmarks of a free society, this would probably be at the top of the list, or at least close to the top of the list. Um, it's a very epitome of the concept of liberty is freedom of conscience. A lot of other things obviously matter, um, freedom of movement, uh, property ownership, etc., etc. But freedom of conscience, is possibly at the very top. Um, and for that reason, it's very important that we define what this is. The real dilemma with freedom of speech is if we look at it from a universal concept, then we have to accept that there are people in society who have extreme and hateful views. And if we have a concept that is utilitarian by nature, that is intended to be as broad reaching by nature, then we cannot exclude people who have controversial and yes, hateful viewpoints. Um, and this becomes a very difficult area because if you believe in free speech, then deep down you know that it has to extend to people whose views you might find sickening. Um, Voltaire is sometimes associated with the saying, I disagree with what you um, what you say or what you believe, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Now, whether that was Voltaire or not, there's some debate about. But anyway, it's a very poignant, um, poignant statement. In other words, if you really believe in this, you have to be prepared to defend the right of people whose views you might find obnoxious. Um, so here's an issue for me. To what extent do you allow people to have views um, that are extreme and hateful insofar as defending the right to have them, but not helping them to be promoted? This is where the issue of um, giving people a platform becomes an issue. Now, I think there's a difference between universities and um, the wider public sphere. What I mean by that is do I think that controversial people should be allowed to speak at university campuses? I would say yes. The reason being is that universities are seats of learning and they should be centres of debate. Honest, candid debate. So should people who are associated with far right political parties be allowed to speak at universities? Um, it's difficult to say no if you believe in freedom of expression. 
Likewise, should Islamists be allowed to speak? Again, this is a difficult area. It's difficult to say no if you believe in freedom of expression. Now, the caveat here is if somebody is advocating simply viewpoints, then then um, it's difficult to ban that. But if they're specifically advocating violence or discrimination against another group, then that can be banned because that translates from being a speech to being an action, an advocacy of an action at least. So let me give you an example. If I say I hate group A, I hate these people because of such and such reasons, my viewpoint would be hateful and it would be certainly contentious. But I think that's different from saying I hate this group and I want my followers to use violence against them and I'm going to use violence against them. I'm going to throw rocks at them. I'm going to attack them in the street. So I think we have to be very clear that there's a difference between hate, which is not a good thing, and using violence. Now, don't get me wrong, I am not for a second saying that hate should be in any way encouraged. So in terms of the no platforming policy that universities take, I think the issue I take with that is not consistent. Um, they know platform right-wing speakers, but very often universities become hotbeds for far-left ideology. If they were at least consistent with this, I'd have more respect for the position and I could understand the position. But for me, the whole university thing, it's, the problem is it's inconsistent. Now, in terms of the wider public sphere, do I think that um, neo-nationalist activists, white supremacist activists, Islamists, anti-Semites, etc., people who have views which can clearly be interpreted as bigoted towards another group, should they be allowed or, or should they be given interviews on television? My issue would be, why give them a platform in a sphere that is going to, you know, stir up animosity towards other groups? To me, not giving them a platform is not the same as denying their right to an opinion. It's very different from imposing a law against them having an opinion. But I do think, to a certain extent, there has to be some responsibility on the issue of free speech. Because if you have someone who's, who's well known for stirring up hatred against a particular group, I don't think it's responsible to give them a platform, i.e. a television interview or a television show, just to get ratings. Now, I don't think it should be a case that they're never on television. And if if you have a pol particularly political party that has proven that it has support, regardless of how that support has come about, if they're proven to have support, let's say, for example, you have a white supremacist or let's say neo-nationalist political party that is proven to have a lot of support, then should they be allowed to stand in the election? Well, if they're not using violence, it's difficult to say no. However, if their members are proven to ha are using, you know, be using violent intimidation tactics, you know, street thug tactics, then definitely they should be, um, there should be legal action taken against them. But this is a very, very grey and complex area because you end up being in a situation where you can end up being a hypocrite. Because if you say that freedom of speech is absolute, then with that, you have to allow hateful opinions. If you say that freedom of speech is not absolute and that we pick and choose who gets to have freedom of speech, that again becomes problematic because those who harbour extreme views will say, you're hypocrites. And that's why it's a difficult thing. But quite frankly, I would prefer to have a situation where bigots have their views and are exposed and can be challenged, rather than say they can't have their views and they're kind of driven underground, and you have a situation where there's building animosity and 
they then resort to more extreme tactics like, for example, terrorism. Is it not better to let someone with extreme political views be exposed in the public sphere so they can be challenged and exposed and criticised and made to look like fools in some cases, rather than totally muzzle them to the point where they go underground? Now, I, am, I appreciate some of the things I've said here. I, I, I'm even aware myself might sound contradictory. And that, that's just in line with the complex nature of this subject. I can't even decide myself exactly what is the right approach to this. Um, I do believe that where an action is taking place, it can't be described as a speech. So when the paparazzi, for example, say, oh, you can't stop us because it's freedom of speech. No, it's not. It's an action. It's taking photographs of people without their permission. That's not speech. That's not an opinion. That is an action. So for that reason, I do think the paparazzi's activities should be made illegal. Plain illegal. It's stalking. It's not photography. It's stalking. Well, it is photography, but it's you get what I'm saying. So I think that freedom of speech can sometimes be used by people who are not actually making a speech. They're not actually formulating an opinion. They're forming an action. And there is a difference, clearly, between an action and a speech. And likewise, if you get someone who stands up on a podium and says, I hate these people. But we'll take, for example, the Nazis in the 30s um, when Hitler made his rants you know, in, in beer halls, when the Nazis used that sort of behaviour, it, it was speech, it was opinion, but it was obviously used to stir up hatred against the Jews, that they were enemies of the German people, that they were, you know, uh, plotting against the German state, etc. And that, of course, led to uh, pogroms and then eventually the Holocaust. So, it's incredibly naive to say that speech in itself is, is harmless. Of course it's not. Speech can be dangerous. But I still think it's better to allow bigots to expose themselves and to be challenged than totally drive them underground to the point where they then might resort to more extreme tactics like terrorism. Um, okay, so we'll leave it there. Let me know your thoughts. And the question really is, is there a red line when it comes to free speech? I happen to believe that where people are using their viewpoints solely to stir up aggression against a group, to stir up bullying behaviour, like I said in the previous video, if, for example, you have um, someone who is being bullied either in their school or in their workplace, and the bully or bullies, more likely the plural, is, for example, using Facebook to, to target them, the bully might say, oh, it's my freedom of speech. But then if it's being used in a way, like if they're sending messages, kill yourself, you're ugly, you're fat, you're whatever. Um, that's being used to hurt someone. So I stand by people's right to have a controversial viewpoint. But there is clearly a fine line between having a view which is controversial and actually advocating the hurting of someone else. Sticks and stones may break my bones, um, uh, but words will never hurt me. You know the old rhyme? Well, it's clearly rubbish. Words can hurt. Words can be damaging. And words can be inflammatory. And I, as much as I dislike political correctness, I will always say that everybody has a responsibility with the words. I recently came across someone, and I might discuss this in more detail in another video, but she would take no responsibility for a word. She came out with extreme, absurd sta statements. Let me just put it this way. In my view, she was a total apologist for Islamist ideology. She was a convert. I'll get into this more in another video. But she would come out with these extreme statements and then imply that people were picking on her when they challenged her on these viewpoints. So everyone has responsibility for the things that they say. If I, in a moment of anger, say something very heated, I can't complain if people criticise me for it. So I stand by people's right to be controversial, but we also have responsibility for our own words. And that goes without saying. Let me know your thoughts.